Welcome to Nerd Out at Spotify, where we bring you behind the curtain of the world's most popular audio streaming subscription service. Machine learning, open source, clouds, tabs versus spaces. We'll talk to Spotify engineers about interesting tech issues, big and small. In this episode, we're going to step outside the walls of Spotify and talk with developers at Netflix and American Airlines. Both companies were early adopters of Backstage, the platform for building developer portals that Spotify open sourced in 2020. Open source can be a great way to solve common tech problems together, whether it's a small project designed to do one super specific thing or big projects like Kubernetes, which started an open source infrastructure revolution. Backstage has become one of those big projects designed to solve a big problem infrastructure complexity. How do you keep all the tools, processes, and software components in your tech ecosystem from bogging down your developers? That's what we asked our guests. First, we'll hear from Lori Barth and Brian Leatham, both engineers on Netflix's Platform Experience and Design Team, or PXD. After that, I'll talk with Melinda Malmgren, the technical lead for American Airlines DevOps team. At first, streaming services and an airline may seem like two very different kinds of software engineering organizations. But as you'll hear, we all have a lot in common when it comes to managing complex tech ecosystems and helping our fellow developers build great products. You'll also hear some of the perils of being such early adopters. All right, so let's just start with some intros. Lori, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Lori Barth. I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix on the platform experience and design team, helping to build out a product we're calling Spotlight, which is going to bring together a lot of different tools around Netflix that we want developers to have access to, um, sort of dashboards of information for the various applications they build, maintain, use, all of those things. And yeah, I've been there for just shy of a year now. I mean, nine months. We're rounding up a lot, but who cares? <laughs> <laughs> rounding up sounds fine. And you said platform experience and design. What does that mean? I feel like platform usually is very different from experience and design. At Netflix, we sort of have different sides of the coin on the engineering side. We obviously have all the streaming products, but we also run a studio. And platform is sort of the foundational tools that all of the different engineers use. So platform experience and design is about, Brian's going to correct me if I'm wrong because he's been around a lot longer than I have, but platform experience and design is like the experience and design for the platform products and trying to bring that together to make that more cohesive and a smoother experience for all of the engineers in the larger organization. It was well said, Lori. Thank you. <laughs> all right. I'm Brian Leatham. I've been at Netflix just over four years on the platform experience and design team with Lori. We have this platform team. It's a central engineering team that provides the platform for Netflix engineers to build the Netflix software on top of. Prior to that, I was in what we call these local central teams. I was on a local central team, which is an experience team embedded in one of our experience teams. So I worked on the Edge developer experience team, where Edge is the set of tools and microservices that exist right at the boundary of the Netflix ecosystem before the data, the responses, the streaming goes out to customers. So we built some developer tools specifically for those use cases. So are any of the awesome Netflix OSS projects we all have heard of coming out of some of the teams you were on? Yeah, for sure. So Zool is a big one that came out of the Gateway project from the Edge team. Definitely a well-known one. Spinnaker is another open source project that Netflix participated heavily in. That's come out of our platform team. I'm sure many others not coming to mind. <laughs> yep. No, I've at least heard of both of those. So let's jump right in. You've both already touched on Spotlight. And I think Brian mentioned that it's related to Backstage. First of all, I want to say Spotlight is a fantastic name and I want to know how you came up with it. We did like an open source, internal open source approach to it. We solicited names from folks, collected in a Word document, got people to comment what they liked about it, what they didn't like about it. Actually, the, the leading front runner before Spotlight was my suggestion was Pilot. And we were all really excited about Pilot. We wanted to get bomber jackets as swag, and that was <laughs> going to be our, our project. But then someone came along and pointed out that if we talk about the Pilot project, people might get confused thinking it's always perpetually a POC. <laughs> So we moved on from there to another suggestion, which was Spotlight. We were looking for something that had, you know, a bit of a Netflix stage production kind of motif and, you know, shining a light on the developer experience and Spotlight fit that role. So then tell me a little bit more about how you even came to realize you needed something like this. 
So that's uh, an interesting journey. We had a real shift in platform to be more product driven, have a more cohesive approach across platform in terms of how we solve problems and deliver those problems to our Netflix engineers, our customers. And part of that effort was recognizing that we had a very fragmented platform experience and very fragmented strategic approach across those teams, right? So a platform team respond to customer requests. And when I say customer, I mean Netflix engineer. They would respond to customer requests with solutions for them. They would try and solve it to gain leverage across the company. But different teams were responding to different parts of the organizations differently. And then as we've shifted from being just a streaming company to now a streaming company and a studio company and a gaming company, we had a number of competing initiatives coming in. And so we needed to be able to prioritize those across all the platform. And part of that realization was we needed a common front door. We needed a single pane of glass for engineers to be able to work with our products. And we need to improve the onboarding experience for new developers. We're going through a lot of hiring right now, a lot of new engineers coming on. And as they try and pick up the tribal knowledge from their teammates in terms of how they build and manage the applications of the team, it was all very opaque. And so we wanted to provide a better discovery experience for new engineers. And so we're now probably a year into our journey with Backstage and building out our Spotlight solution. There are a lot of tools and a lot of different things that people build from libraries to applications to servers and databases and all these other things. And so when you're new, as I was not that long ago, you learn a lot of things just through mention or sort of running into it or tripping over it. But the discoverability of that can be challenging when there's just so many pieces and not everyone can know about every other tool. So finding a way where you can discover things for yourself is uh, of great benefit. That's exactly what I was actually going to ask you, Laurie, because at Spotify, we say a lot of the same things Brian just said for Backstage as a whole. But after being here for so long, I wonder if that's like us seeing things or if that's real problems that new hires genuinely experience. It sounds like when you started at Netflix, it was quite real. Oh, it's very real. <laughs> and I also came from smaller organizations. And so this was one of the first large engineering organizations I'd worked in in quite some time. And they warned me. They said, you're not going to feel productive right away. You're not going to know everything after six months, after a year. And that was very freeing and wonderful. But at the same time, I looked around and I was like, what are all these names? What are all these things? Like, <laughs> what do they do? Yeah. I want to add to the discovery experience is a problem for long tenured engineers as well. They've been here for a long time. They know their way of doing, accomplishing their task. In the meantime, new solutions, new problems have come up and they're not discovering those unless they by chance speak to someone who is doing similar kind of work and relates that. So the impact of discovery is far beyond just the, the new hire, but we call it our paved road, right? Our paved road is the set of solutions that brings you from your idea to your deployed service you consume platform products along that paved road. So as we evolve the paved road and prove it over time, we want to make sure that we're providing a mechanism for all engineers to learn about the improvements and pick those up. Well, I'm curious with some of these problems, like what is the scale of these things within Netflix? I don't know, roughly, I mean, things like how many components, how many engineers are starting and having to onboard on all this stuff? Like how big is Netflix R&D that feels these pains? Yeah, we're building out this common front door, as we call it, with the use cases of thousands of engineers in mind, right? So there's a few thousand engineers at Netflix. And I think one thing that, I don't know, maybe it makes Netflix engineers uh, unique is our engineers, they tend to own the services that they build and operate, right? So they come up with the service they want to provide all the way from the first commit to putting it into deploying it into production to operating it to monitoring the alerts applying security fixes and everything that's all the same team that owns it throughout that life cycle so as we're building out our solutions we have to think of these individual netflix engineers needing to participate in all aspects of the sdlc of the service that they're operating and so it changes the the scale perception differently I think. Yeah, that all sounds extremely similar to Spotify. I mean, the, the, like thousands of engineers and owning all aspects of the service sounds extremely familiar. And there are more services than there are engineers. Yes. So for the context of just how many services there are, and uh, probably by many fold, if you really count everything up. Yeah, and I guess that just makes all of these tools so much more important because there's no way that they know all of those well. And so they need all of your tools to make it manageable through the full SDLC. 
So here is a funny story. We just turned on two weeks ago a feature in Spotlight, our backstage implementation, that provides a page listing all of my software. This is a software owned by me and my teammates. So as I was developing it, I turned it on, went to the page, got the listing back, and it said there was 80 pieces of software that I owned. <laughs> so that was a, a bit of a shock. Some of it is ours, our teams. Some of it is just carryover from previous teams. Some of it is just in there with bad org data. It's owned by previous team members. Some of it's old Hello World apps. And so this surfacing it through Spotlight and getting this in front of everyone's eyes, I think is going to help us clean that up. Pretty excited about that. As someone with no org history, I'm pretty sure it still came back with 15 or 20 for me. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of services. <laughs> How many of those had you never heard of? Very few, actually. I at least recognize the names of most. I think there was one that was like something playground. And I was like, oh, that's just someone on our team just made a pet project to test something out at some point, And I'm not going to worry about that, it. That, that's reasonable. I, I always love the stories when it's like, there was this one I didn't recognize and it's handling, I don't know, a few million QPS. So I should probably figure out what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Or it's secretly right. running up a giant AWS bill and no one uses it. Exactly. Yeah, I, I was hoping to get one of you to tell me that story, but it sounds like your parts of the company are at least enough together to not have that problem. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we have an entire org, that, and I might be making this up, but I think when I onboarded, I heard that there's like an entire org that's dedicated to just like trying to take stuff down and seeing if anyone notices. And if no one <laughs> notices, great, it doesn't need to be operating. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm curious if you guys think that life as a developer today is easier or harder than it, in the past, and you can kind of decide where that is. And I'll kind of seed you a little bit in that I think today, developers have a lot more power. We can do things like spin up cloud services really quickly, and you can have like thousands of servers or some crazy databases or whatever you want in the cloud almost instantly, and all the open source tooling and all the stuff we have. And on the other hand, like Brian said, at a lot of companies, developers own their services through the entire software development lifecycle and everything from on-call to security to kind of every patch is on them. So you get both sides of, of that power. And I'm curious if you think, first of all, how much stuff I've missed, but also like how much easier or harder life is now than it was before a bunch of this power. I think getting things working in the past was harder. The challenges now are different, not necessarily harder. Paradox of choice just the number of things you can choose. It's not an obvious, oh, I want to make this thing. And so this framework is available and that's what you use. You have to make 60 choices before you get something working. And then I think on the flip side of that, the minimum viable product of what an experience should be is much higher. So what you need to do for something to be quote unquote working, it's just more complex now. It involves more things. It involves more tools. It has a higher level of quality because the baseline for what you can produce in the tools that you're given is at a higher level to start with. Because things are so complex to get started, there's so many off-the-shelf solutions you can get started with nowadays that weren't available when I started my career. I remember step one used to be order the server. <laughs> step two was put it in the rack, right? <laughs> Install the OS, right? You did, you did everything. Whereas now with all these cloud providers and all these frameworks and this diversity of choice, as Laurie described it, there tends to be canned solutions. So you can get to a productive state really quickly, you know, with just a couple of clicks of the button. But now the problem is when something goes wrong or you want to change something, you don't understand everything beneath you. And so how can you change it for your particular use case or your novel solution, right? We're engineers. We want to solve novel problems. We don't want to solve the exact same cookie cutter solution that everyone else has. The level of abstraction will always increase. And anyone who thinks that's inherently a bad thing isn't trying to solve problems. They just want to feel smart. They're just upset that no one else knows x86 assembly anymore. Yep. And as someone who knows MIPS assembly, I would happily forget it. <laughs> yes, it's people that are upset that no one else knows x86 assembly. Not just everyone that knows x86 assembly. Yeah. I would love to pick at that some more, but I guess we should get back to Backstage. I'm, <laughs> I'm curious how you decided on using Backstage as, I don't know, I was almost going to say the core, but I guess you can tell me if it's the core of Spotlight or not, but how you landed on using Backstage at all. After identifying the need for this developer portal, we decided to start on the implementation. The first decision we had to make is, like, are we going to build this in-house? Are we going to take an off-the-shelf product and, and build on top of that? We were reluctant to build a custom solution for this, given the number of solutions out there that are available, some open source, some closed source. 
And we wanted to tap into existing ecosystems, existing communities, and, and leverage those ideas. So building something internally would only really make sense if, you know, we were going to build the best thing and then open source it and, you know, build a community around that. And with Backstage already having done that, it didn't make that a lot of sense. So we looked at Backstage. We looked at a couple other open source solutions as well. We even met with some companies here in the Valley who have internal solutions that they were willing to partner on. And in the end, we decided that Backstage was just the right fit for us. Backstage, for the most part, solved the UI aspects that we were wanting to solve. We had this idea coming into it that we wanted to build out our developer portal in a federated manner with our platform partners as providers. We knew we wanted to federate on the back end using GraphQL. So when we want to partner with a platform team and they bring their solution to the developer portal, they need to be able to provide the back end through GraphQL Federation, and how are they going to provide the front end? And so Backstage plugins made a really good fit for that. What do we mean when we say that we have a like federated GraphQL solution? Because I think I've heard a bunch of people use that term in slightly different ways, and why federation is so important in that solution. To us at Netflix or to PXD specifically, a federated solution means that you can bring a lot of different teams together to provide their specific functionality, bring in their domain expertise, and then it sort of all gets stitched together in some capacity versus expecting that, you know, the six members of our team are able to have deep knowledge into what alerts data should look like or what languages should be propagated for a different service or how the builds plugin should look. All of those things are brought from different domain areas, different teams. They have the knowledge and the ability to provide those solutions and it all gets federated together and we're sort of providing the foundational information and the framework within which they can build those solutions. Early on in the project, when we were a smaller team, we were just bootstrapping the development effort. We as PXD, we were very involved in the development of all the plugins. And at a certain point, as we brought more and more provider teams on board, we realized we had to step back and we couldn't be involved in the development of the designs and solving of the problem across all these plugins. We really had to focus on enabling those folks and let them solve the problem with our designer of how to give the customer experience the best solution. So this is an example of how we're federating in the solution and solving the the customer experience across all these different pieces of the platform. If we weren't federated, if we were a single team, we would have to do that deep dive. We would have to have all that context and understand everything that our platform provider partners understand as they're building out the solution. They have years of collecting customer feedback and understanding the experience that they're trying to bring to the customers. So by federating the design, federating the API, federating the UI, federating the customer feedback, right? We're able to just scale out our solution in a way that would not be possible as a single team. You said you made some decisions that made it so you couldn't use the existing plugin ecosystem. I'm curious, what were those decisions and why? So one of the decisions we made is we have an internal component library that's used uh, throughout Netflix, and we wanted to be able to leverage that for all of our pages. And that meant that a lot of the built-in pages that come from some of the open source plugins in Backstage didn't make a lot of sense because we were going to have to rewrite their render code anyway in order to make use of that. So that was one of the decisions. GraphQL Federation was one of the huge decisions just because it means that we've actually put the catalog behind that GraphQL API. And so instead of using the backstage backend that's technically turned off. We use all of the backstage UI functionality. Makes sense. And I think you you lost me a bit on the internal component library. Is that like UX components or like platform components that you already have some kind of UX around that you needed injected into backstage? What is the component library? It's UX, it's React component library. So it's the look and feel and all of that. But there are some sort of known ways of handling certain types of data that we want to be consistent on. So whether that's, you know, table views that exist in other applications that we want the look and feel to be the same, not just from a CSS perspective, but also from a, this is how this type of data is displayed throughout all Netflix applications. So being consistent with that and trying to give people views and data that they recognize even in a new system. Yep. 
We were initially pretty excited about the compatibility of these two design systems. So the backstage design system is built on top of Material UI. Hawkins started out also being built on top of Material UI. So we started off by building a Material UI theme for backstage that aligned a lot of the elements between them, you know, similar or the same fonts, similar colorings and so on. But that eventually fell apart as some of the the higher level design decisions we made weren't compatible. Like we wanted a vertical navigation versus the horizontal navigation that Backstage was using. The reason why we wanted to choose Hawkins, our design system, was to give our users a consistent experience as they go between the Netflix internal applications, right? And so Hawkins is a new bet for us in platform. We haven't done this previously. Every project had their own open source, typically open source component set that they built on top of. So Hawkins was our bet to build on the successful design system that we developed for the studio side of the house and bring it into platform, build our platform tools across that to be able to give users this consistent experience. Tell me Hawkins is named after uh, Stranger Things. It absolutely is. (laughs) So far, all the names I've heard from you guys have been excellent. We've done a good job of avoiding all the acronym-based ones. Thank goodness. Cool. So tell me what some of the pain points of doing all of that, because it sounds like you had a bunch of really good wins of having Backstage as like a federated UX layer, but it also sounds like you did a lot of stuff that isn't in open source. So I bet it wasn't all kind of, I don't know, rainbows and butterflies getting there. So just getting GraphQL and authentication and some of the other things that we have to handle just because it's an internal Netflix tool, all wired up to the Backstage implementation. It it took a little time, I think on both fronts. There was a lot of sort of toiling back and forth of like, okay, How far do we want to take some of the code gen pieces of this so that we have the TypeScript safety and dealing with all of the cache policies and all things that you would have had to deal with GraphQL anyway, but there's no sort of recommended approach in Backstage because most people aren't aren't using a federated GraphQL Backstage backend. So there's no like community of practice around that at this point. We did get a lot of great things from Backstage that enabled us. Having the whole plugin mechanism in place and wired up through the app out of the box and having, you know, like the dev environment for a plugin where typically the development starts with a backend partnership where you shape the schema with a backend developer, then that gets put into the federation server, possibly with mock data, and then you can consume that and build out the UI. And then any changes you need to make to the schema need to go through the backend engineer and come forward. So we're able to flip that around, right? A UI developer coming to contribute to Spotlight can spin up a plugin, go into the dev mode and start mocking out the schema to be exactly what they need it for the UI, when they get to a good point, they can take that schema, open up a PR into one of the DGSs, the domain graph services that federate into the single API, open up a PR and say, hey, this is the schema that I need and iterate with a backend engineer through the PR from a good starting point. They know what their needs are for the UI. So that was a, a pretty big win. So that was a, a fun thing that came out of really just the backstage dev mode plugin being there for us to build on top of and, and enabling that effort. Yeah. I guess you've both talked a little bit about GraphQL and the GraphQL Federation you do as being like both a very big difference from uh, the service catalog, as well as a thing that's really important to Netflix. Tell me a little bit more about what that is and why Netflix cares so much about it. There's this really great Netflix engineering blog post on federated GraphQL at Netflix, which could speak to this at a a higher level than I think either of us would be able to. But Netflix has sort of bought into this approach of federated GraphQL. And what that means is we can have multiple repos writing these domain graph services and you can query the federated endpoint and it'll go off to one service to get these three fields and another service to get these four fields and another service to get these two fields and give it all back to you as if it were a single query in the first place, which is super powerful and really helpful when you want to be able to have a separation of concerns of the different backend services that need to worry about serving this information. It also makes it really nice uh, so that you don't have to duplicate information in six different systems and databases and, you know, rest endpoints. It's available so long as there's sort of this federated contract that's been fulfilled. It's a bet that Netflix has made that a lot of teams have seen really pay off and PXD and platform as a whole sort of wanted to start going down that path and seeing where we could benefit from it as well. Tell me a little bit about where Spotlight is now. How far along the path is it? How many users is it getting? How's the response been at Netflix to the product? 
So we're approaching a milestone for Spotlight. We're going to do our, our GA of our MVP solution end of quarter. So we aren't GA yet. We have about a dozen MVP test users that have been using it for the past several months. They've been super excited, super supportive of this, this project. They really see the need for it. They're very anxious for us to get to a point where it can be uh, part of the regular tool chain. But the real test day for us will be when we go live. So very excited for that date coming up. And we're at about, I think if I heard correctly this morning, we're at about 900 services that are going to be part of that, at this moment in time, part of that initial MVP launch of services that we would expect our current functionality can support and give meaningful data about. So then tell me about the, the depth, kind of how much, how rich is Spotlight for those Java service and libraries? So it's pretty rich. There's, I want to say maybe five or six plugins that are providing separate types of information, not to mention all of the plugins that are working together to provide like overview pages. But one of the biggest bets we made and one of the biggest pieces of functionality is this idea of collections, which is a grouping of services. So users can make their own collection that says, you know, these are the five services that I need to worry about on Monday, or these are the six services that I'm in charge of on support day or whatever it is that's relevant to them. And then they get the ability to see some views and some information based entirely on that collection of services. So if you had a health or a builds plugin, right, across a collection of applications. I could look at all the applications that my team owns. I could see the current application health and the status of the last build across the fleet of applications. And from there, drill down to see which ones need attention, which ones we need to dig into. So this dealing of services in bulk is really something that's appealed to our users as we share the idea of this developer portal and what it would bring developers. They're able to manage applications now on a one-by-one -one basis. They might have to go to a number of systems, but they can do it. What they don't have today is the ability to manage a set of applications altogether. And this is something new that we're building out with Spotlight. That's really cool. I think that's a thing we haven't really spent too much time building out internally, but I'm sure j just the way you talk about it, is like very clear and obvious value. So one other question I had when you were talking about GA is what you think are the pieces that are going to be challenging about GA and getting past this few dozen to actually getting these kind of 900 plus service and library owners to use this thing. Like there's technical challenges, there's organizational challenges, there's probably stuff I'm not even thinking of, like cultural things. What's going to be hard going from 12 to hundreds of engineers using this thing? Well, the first problem we're going to have to figure out is who has pager duty that first week. <laughs> <laughs> not me. Hashtag not me. <laughs> I mean, my instinct is sort of an if you build it, they will come. Like this thing is so needed that I don't think we're going to have any shortage of input. And that's maybe the challenge. I don't think the challenge is going to be adoption. I think the challenge is going to be all of the feedback we get and all of the requests for, hey, can you do this? Hey, can you add this? But that's speculation. I mean, I don't think we really know yet. Yeah, I, I view it as we need to have this critical mass of functionality, and then we'll get to that snowballing effect that Lori describes. A number of teams talk about this idea of going where the developer is, right? So all our platform provider partner teams want to bring their functionality to Spotlight and meet the developer where they are. But we have a critical mass of functionality to get to that. Is this set of functionality that we carved out for MVP sufficient for that critical mass? Probably not. For some engineers in a particular use case, yeah, it will be. So how can we expand that in meaningful ways? Plan, a roadmap, is something that we're in heavy discussion about right now, exploring some of these ideas. So pretty excited to leverage that capability and platform now moving forward. Yeah, and I guess on that note, before you get all the feedback to the things people want, what are the things that you know you want to have, do next? Oh, that's a long list. <laughs> the thing that comes to mind, this is hyper specific, but it's just, it's been a thing that was in our like stretch goals for a while. There isn't really a single source for where to contact people for specific applications, for development questions, for feature requests, for support questions, all of those things. And that's one of the pieces of metadata with a bunch of complexity around it that we plan and, and hope to add. So it, since that's been on my uh, backlog list for quite a while, that's the first thing that comes to mind. One big one that we're not addressing for MVP is just creating new services, creating applications, right? So we're expecting users to use existing tooling to create it and then import it into Spotify. Sorry. 
spotlight. You knew you were going to do it at least once. (laughs) I do that. I do that to my team all the time. Spotify and Spotlight are way too similar for us to have chosen that. We will happily accept Netflix's service creation process if you need to give it to Spotify. (laughs) Excellent. Thank you both for being here. This has been a lot of fun and I'm super interested to see where Spotlight goes from here. Awesome. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you for having us. Great conversation. Now, we'll talk to Melinda Malmgren from American Airlines. For American, Backstage could not have appeared at a better time. The airline was already in the middle of a large transformation to their tech culture, embracing a DevOps mindset and changing how their teams work together. But when you change culture, you often need to change tooling and routines as well, and Backstage was the right tool for that job. And of course, then there was a pandemic, which pushed the airline to accelerate their transformation even faster. Are you in Sweden? Yes. Did I hear that right? Yes, that is why we did this at this ungodly, miserable hour for you, and I apologize. Oh, no, this is perfect. Starting my day off. (laughs) So I guess let's start with Melinda. Can you tell me a little bit about who you are? Hi, everyone. I am Melinda Momgren, and I am the product technical leader for American Airlines DevOps Tech product. I actually just hit my eight-year anniversary with the airline this month, but that job title has been a fairly recent change for me as of November. I spent the last year and a half prior to that working on our engineering excellence team, which is very closely related to our developer experience team. Can you tell me a little bit more about what your team does? So our developer experience product is only a couple years old. It was actually born out of our adoption of Backstage and standing up a developer experience platform during 2020. But our developer experience product is definitely something that's been needed for a lot longer than that. But there was just kind of the perfect catalyst that happened during the pandemic. And Runway, which is what we call Backstage internally, was born just during that perfect storm in 2020. American Airlines IT is a few thousand folks. I would say at least half of those are engineers, so probably 1,500 or more are software engineers. I do know we have over 500 squads and at least 100 products. So for those of you familiar with the product model, we're a pretty large organization. And it's kind of funny. Every time somebody asks me about IT at American, they're kind of shocked because they assume IT at an airline just means we fix the phones and do things like that. They don't understand how we could have 1,500 developers working on something. And it's amazing the amount of engineers that it takes to keep the world's largest airline running. Cool. So you said you said that dev experience was a need you've had for a long time. Can you just dig a little bit more into what that need was and why it's been kind of a pressing need for a long time? Like what kind of business impact has that had on the company? So as most companies can probably relate, we had a very ticket-based system. So when you needed something done with an IT, it was fill out a ticket, wait, hope that somebody responds to it quickly. It was that swivel chair, like, hey, we just got a ticket, let's take care of it type of thing. And so in, I believe it was 2020, when we first started to focus on automation, there were teams that were doing it, of course, for their platforms, but it was very siloed. So Somebody might automate something for firewall access over here, and they might do a great job, but you had to know that it was there, you had to remember the URL, and teams were just taking a lot of time to stand up these automation platforms, and they were creating their own UIs, and it just, we weren't repeating and reusing what we had, and it was very siloed. And so the idea of having a central platform for developers, and especially standardizing how we create apps and automating all of the tickets, it was a universal need, but the solution wasn't quite there yet for us, at least until 2020. Do you have some, maybe one or two concrete examples of a place where you had a lot of this like repetition, lack of standardization, and the impact that was having on the, the airline's ability to get work done? One of the, the best examples I can think of is actually our technical coaches. So when we're doing those hangar experiences, which is our equivalent of dojos here at American Airlines, the coaches would be bootstrapping new projects with teams and walking them through new ways of working. But the problem was they were doing it from scratch. And sometimes they were copying and pasting a repo they had used with the last team. And then they they knew which tickets to kick off, but they were always rinsing and repeating the same request over and over every time we tried to create a new app. So our technical coaches were actually the ones that really pushed for something along the lines of this platform, which eventually became Runway, because they wanted the ability to just kick off a project quickly, easily follow all of the company standards, and then get onto the good stuff of actually adding functionality, working with the teams on their best practices and things like that, instead of spending six to eight weeks trying to get a new application stood up and then go into all the rest of it. So that's one of the prime examples I can think of where we were wasting efforts across the company is every time we kicked off a new project, there was no standard way to do it. 
So you said it took six to eight weeks to get an application set up. I'm curious what happened during those six to eight weeks. Yeah. So initially at American Airlines, getting a new app off the ground would require just provisioning in the cloud, a resource group set up to deploy to. Obviously creating a repo and a deployment was the easy step for the team to do. But things like getting the firewall access set up, getting the DNS set up, complying with our security policies and going through all of those steps. It was the type of thing that would take six to eight weeks because there was always that one ticket that just kind of took forever to get through. You might get a couple back quickly, but everything that depended on an external team required waiting for that ticket to come back. And so having that automated just streamlines it right out of the box. We like to call it batteries included. So you mentioned technical coaches a few times, and I wanted to go back to this. Can you talk a little bit more about that role? I'm not really familiar with what a technical coach is. Yeah, so here at American, when we put a team through the hangar experience, they can get coaching on agile, product model, all sorts of other things. And the idea is to take them out of their day-to-day work and get them completely immersed in the hangar. And part of that is we have technical coaches. So these are typically senior or principal engineers that know their way around coding and development and best practices and they will jump into the code with the team. So rather than going through agile coaching or something like that, this is where they actually dig into the code. They learn pair programming or mob programming. For some teams, it's how to open a pull request and why that's important, getting back to the basics. But the idea is just to break them out of the patterns that they may have been working in for a long time and introducing them to new ways of working with development. So the technical coaches are very much into the weeds. They're writing code. They're leading pair programming sessions. They're usually kicking off new projects with teams and just showing them new ways of working. I'm curious, what was key? I mean, 2020 was was special for a bunch of reasons, but I'm curious in this sense, like what was key about 2020 for things to really change at American Airlines? Yeah, I know going back to 2020 is probably not um, appealing to most folks, but just to paint the picture of where we were a couple of years ago is we're a few months into the pandemic. And for us, working from home was kind of a new concept. We didn't do that quite as much in American Airlines IT prior to the pandemic. So Here we are working from home. That's a little bit unusual for us. The airline industry is falling apart. The world feels like it's falling apart. It's just a different time. And so we had some engineers that were available and there were some conversations going about, you know, what are we going to do about developer experience? How are we going to get that kicked off? Is now the perfect time during this disruption to our industry to try to kick that off? And we as an airline, were trying to figure out resources and who's going where and what products are impacted and It was just a really busy time, but sometimes during those moments of disruption, perfect opportunities happen. And I would say that's what happened with Runway is, oddly enough, it came up in a couple of Slack channels where somebody said something simple like, hey, has anybody heard of Backstage? This was just announced. It's open source. And at American Airlines, we are very pro open source, both as consumers, but also as a company that wants to pour back into something larger than just ourselves. The idea of adopting a platform that would meet these needs that we could use but also pour back into was was very appealing for us. So a couple of Slack messages sparked the idea, and then those technical coaches had the time to go work on it for a while. And I think over the course of about two, maybe three weeks, they had backstage stood up internally, and we were like, this looks really cool. Obviously, it was pretty bare bones at that point, didn't actually have much automated, but I think a lot of us could see the potential and we knew the needs that the company had for a central platform like this, a central front door for automation. And so there was a lot of excitement around it and leadership was willing to invest in it. And I think that's one of the key things that I think about is you have grassroots, like developers want this, they need this, but then there's also leadership being willing to support it. And so here we are Somebody standing up backstage, and I would call it more of a grassroots effort, but then leadership was willing to say, okay, go spend the next couple of months working on it. So later that fall is when I would say it kind of took off, and I do know that our CIO was very supportive of it. She sent out notifications about it. It was talked about during all hands, and Runway kind of became a common name that everybody knew about, and I think that was key for getting buy-in because... Runway isn't here just to have a team sit up behind it and, you know, functionality pumped out for everybody to use. The idea was that it's an inner source platform. So it's here for all of us. And if we had stood it up in such a way that it required waiting for the platform team to update it, I think that would have been detrimental to its success. So the fact that it's inner source and easy to contribute to is, I think, key to the success of Runway here at American. Can you Talk a little bit about how you kind of went from this being a thing that some collection of 
Iceweam engineers were playing with to a thing that got as far as the CIO talking about it in all hands and sending out emails. Yeah, so that catalyst that I was talking about in 2020, that perfect storm, what was interesting is that Ross Clanton had just joined our company in early 2020, for folks that are familiar with that name. And he's leading our org that's called Technology Transformation. And so he had the technical coaches, he has our you know developer experience product now, and he had this org that he was building from scratch. And so he he's in Slack with us, he's seeing these messages about backstage, and he was the one that actually encourage the coaches, please go work on this if you have time. So that's where we got that upper leadership buy-in pretty early on. Like he was aware of what we were doing and he was interested in it. And then he was the one going to Maya Liebman, our CIO, being like, hey, look what they did. The engineers love this. It's getting great feedback. I'd really like to pour into this. And he was the one that helped pave that way for us. Since you mentioned both Maya and Ross, I recently listened to some things that they recorded and they talked a lot about some of the transformation that they've been trying to do at American. I'm curious how you would describe that process on the ground, getting the stuff done point of view. Yeah, that's been a journey that we've been on for a while. So having Ross join us in 2020 was really exciting to have him be part of this transformation with us. But yeah, in less CIO, CTO type terms from an engineer who's been on the ground throughout it and for the last eight years, I can say that we have the typical problems that large companies have where we have a lot of silos. Somebody might solve something really cool over here, but somebody even just a few cube rows over doesn't know about it. The problem of discoverability and sharing and reuse is something we struggle with a lot or at least used to struggle with a lot at American Airlines. And so the last couple of years, I've gotten to focus on Intersource at American. And so we've probably been on a three to four year journey with Intersource. And for anybody who hasn't heard that word before, it's I like to describe it as the use of open source best practices, but with inside the walls of a company. So having repos that are really easy to contribute to, really easy to pick up and run with, safe to contribute to with all of the gates and checks needed, and just really easy feedback between the maintainers and contributors. That sort of concept at American Airlines didn't exist three to four years ago. We had a lot of code bases that were either hidden away, they weren't even read-only for anybody to get access to them, let alone to contribute to them. And we've had a huge shift towards being more of an open org as far as all of our code bases are read-only, they're open. Whether or not they're officially intersourced and interested in contributions, that's a different story. But we've had a huge shift towards sharing more. And part of that journey is also figuring out Where are there opportunities to share code? Is there something we can pull out of this repo and make into a reusable component so that everybody can use it? And as everybody knows, that's hard because when you break something out, then you have to support it over there. And what if something's wrong or what if this team wants something different? So there's a whole shift in mindset that comes with that. And so from my perspective as an engineer for the last few years throughout this transformation, it's just watching as we've opened ourselves up to those ideas and how do we win by winning together? How do we contribute to code that we can all share? It's been really cool to see, but it's obviously a slower journey. Um, it's a marathon, definitely not a sprint. I think we've had multiple inner source style efforts within Spotify and I've seen it at some other companies I've worked at and we've had fits and starts. We've had some successes. I don't necessarily want to call them failures, but like not as bright of successes, I'll put it that way. So I think that's awesome that you're doing that and that it sounds like it's working very well with an American. We've had some failures for sure. Um, We've had some abandoned repos where we're like, oh shoot, what do we do with this one now? We've had some attempts to break out code and share it that have failed, but I think that's part of the journey and that's what we learn from. And I would say the fact that here we are in 2022 with a lot of wide open repos and a a culture of inner source, it shows that, hey, it takes three to four years, but it's worth it and we're getting there. And we can also see where we have a huge road to continue walking down, but it is fun to finally get to see a little bit of progress. Yep, that's really cool. I think I think we definitely didn't expect it to be a three to four year road, but that sounds very familiar with our efforts as well. Yeah, I have to admit, when we first started talking about inner source, I just assumed everybody would be like, this is amazing and <laughs> exactly. want to do it. It was not quite like that. People were like, what? What are you talking about? I'm busy. I have things to get done. Like, I think it was probably right around three or four years ago that a few of the people I was working with and I put together some documents around like inner source and inner source strategy and things we should be doing at Spotify around it. And I would say the same thing. Like if you told me then that four years later, I'd be talking about some successes and some failures that wouldn't have made me very happy four years ago. But now I'll say the successes alone are enough to have made it worth it. 
Yeah, and something that I would add to that is I think the fact that we started our inner source journey a couple of years before Runway came into the picture was pretty important and it helped a lot because the idea that Runway was an inner source platform was not a foreign concept. The idea that, hey, this code base is for all of us. Yes, we're going to have maintainers. We might have full-time engineers assigned to it. But at the end of the day, if you want to automate something, here's how you add a plugin. Here's how Backstage just set it up to make it really easy to add a plugin. And our Runway maintainers are more than happy to help walk you through that process. But at the end of the day, this platform is everyone's platform. It's inner sourced. And I think the fact that we introduced that word inner source early on and it wasn't foreign to our engineers definitely helped a lot. Did you really look at other solutions before you settled on Backstage? Or was this, is this the first foray into having a developer portal at American? Um, I have a feeling if we ask around, there would be engineers that would point to something that they tried to start as a developer experience platform that maybe never you know, got off the ground. But as far as looking at alternatives to Backstage, I don't recall if they formally did that. Because here we, you know, we stood up backstage kind of quickly in May or June of 2020, and it just kind of took off. I do know that about six months into using backstage, once we had a few full-time developers assigned to it, there was a moment where we had to ask, is this what we want to keep working with, or do we want to pivot? And that comes from when you're an early adopter of an open source project, there's always breaking changes that come. And I think as American Airlines being an early adopter, we got to experience a couple of those breaking changes and our engineers had Sorry. to decide. <laughs> oh, no, it's typical. It happens. And I mean, that's a pain point, but it's one that we work through. And But I think it creates an interesting moment to your point of, I mean, do you continue with backstage or do you look at something else? And our engineers had to ask that question. Do we want to keep absorbing breaking changes? Do we want to be part of this? And I'm pretty sure when they looked at alternatives or they made the decision to think about leaving backstage, they came to the conclusion pretty quickly that it was worth continuing to pour into. And we liked where it was headed. We liked the community. We liked what we were seeing out of it. So yeah, there were some bumps in the road early on, but we thought they were worth it. And the team ultimately decided to keep using backstage. Just to, to play devil's advocate, I guess, why does it matter if everyone's following standards and all your services are consistent? I mean, once you've created one, that team creates it, that team owns it. Who cares if it's different from all the other ones? Yeah, our security and compliance team would probably love to do a whole podcast with you on just that topic. <laughs> but part of the problem we have at American Airlines is keeping things up to date, security, compliance, changing standards. If you need to go update something in one repo in order to keep a team compliant, that's really hard to do when there's 100 repos that are using the same thing. Like, do you really want to have to go in and update 100 repos with manual PRs, all that good stuff? But I can say for me as an engineer, I just want to get started and I want to start implementing something. And when you have to be slowed down to be like, okay, what's our security process for APIs? Where do I get that? As an engineer, you just want to start writing your code and implementing what you need for your product owner or whoever it is. And so for me, hitting the ground running, I click a button and five minutes later, I can just start adding my code. Like that's such a freeing feeling for me as an engineer. So how did you go about getting users onto Runway or developers? This is where I would say it started kind of grassroots for a while. We had the pretty, if you will, internal URL in June. And so you could get to it. You could type in the URL and find it. But when you landed on it, it was kind of like, okay, what does this do? And create app in the blueprints. That's really cool. But for teams that are in the, you know, going back to 2020, middle of a pandemic, trying to keep an airline alive during the worst time in airlines history, it wasn't exactly a time when having create app really did much for teams because they're like, we're just trying to keep our apps alive right now and we're not creating new stuff. So there was definitely that moment of people being like, what is this? What's the point of this? And I think it was those first few plugins and teams seeing like, oh, oh, instead of going and creating these three tickets over here in our ticket-based system, I can just go in here and get what I need immediately. And there were some small wins too, as far as like we had a plugin that helped users get access to our DevOps tools. It wasn't a hard ticket to fill out, but it was a ticket and it usually took about an hour to come back. And now here they can go click a button and just have access. It was automated. I would actually say that's one of the biggest ways we got Runway out there is if you needed access to something, the answer was go to Runway and use the automation. And so once we automated access to a couple of our core systems through Runway, it was just a common thing. So for companies that are just adopting Backstage, I would highly recommend that you focus on automating access to a couple of important things, and then that will force your engineers to go through your Backstage instance to get to them, and then it kind of self-advertises Runway. 
One thing you said as well, you said people were, were creating tickets for a lot of these things. Just for clarity, what's a ticket? Is this like log into JIRA, create a JIRA issue, or what are tickets at American Airlines? Yeah, so we use a slightly different system than that, but a very well-known <laughs> ticket-based system where you go in and they ask, you know, like 27 questions and drop-downs that you have to fill out, and some of them don't apply to the ticket you're trying to fill out. And the comical thing there is we have so many different types of tickets that sometimes you're hoping you're filling out the right one. I've filled out a ticket before, waited a few days, and then finally it gets kicked back to me and they just say, you filled out the wrong ticket. Go use this one instead. So any company that's ever used a ticket-based system of any sort can probably relate to this. And when you're a large company with tons of platform teams or enterprise shared service teams, it's just you end up with a lot of tickets. And some of them are complete this one, and then when you're done with that one, this team will work on that ticket. But you can't submit that second one until this first team is done. And even just figuring out what that process is was trial and error quite a bit. Yep. Now, all of that sounds very familiar. Let's talk about where Runway is today. How rich is it now? How many plugins do you have? And I don't necessarily mean numbers, but what sorts of things do people do in Runway today? Yeah, so Runway has grown quite a bit. The access control alone has a ton of functionality built out. Something that we have coming soon is the Create app. We have a ton of functionality there, but we're in the middle of cutting over to the new version of Create app that Backstage just released. So that one's kind of a funny one in that it's in our success category, but it's also in our coming soon. We're very excited about some of the new Create app functionality that's coming out. But we have the ability to new up a project, and we've got a handful of, I think they're called Golden Blueprints core blueprints that we support for standing up a new project and out of the box that comes with a deployment to our shared cluster support for that. So you're not asking for a resource group or cloud resources or a repo or a pipeline that's just all baked in for you. And so that's one of those things where maybe it's a pretty bare bones vanilla hello world app. Maybe it doesn't have all of the automation around it to get every little piece of the app stood up, but it's that solid starting ground. And then other teams have been adding automation around that to automate the next steps or to add things to those blueprints. So it's hard to quantify like the value of that for me and the usage of that. Because I mean, a developer could be playing with it and just be like, hey, this is cool. Or a developer could use it to kick off the next, you know, A.com project that's central to our OKRs for 2022. So kind of runs the gamut. I think that's both very similar to some of what we have on things like our, I think we call them software templates off of our golden path, as well as there's a bunch of things you mentioned that I think we don't typically think of as just being there. One thing, you mentioned shared cluster a few times. What is shared cluster? Like in my head, that's a Kubernetes cluster, but I have no idea what it actually is. That is exactly right. It is a shared Kubernetes cluster hosted in the cloud. And right now, Runway is automating very closely with our shared clusters team, our CAS team, to have that shared cluster. And so the idea is that we don't want every individual product team to have to manage their own Kubernetes cluster. We want to provide that for them and give them flexibility out of the box to be able to use it. But we don't need our 500 squads out there each creating their own Kubernetes cluster. So what other kind of interesting things have you done with Backstage? Like I think Spotify has tried to be fairly public about what we have in Backstage. I'm curious if there's stuff that you've put in Runway that you find as really interesting or new and novel things that American does on Backstage that the rest of us might not. That's an interesting question. My favorite one is actually our inner source marketplace. It used to be a separate site that was stood up prior to Runway, and we moved it in as a Runway plugin because we wanted it to be really easy for engineers to find it and land on it. And what it is, it's a marketplace of all our projects that have been inner source. So... We have a way to tag our repo as being intersourced, and Marketplace makes it really easy to see what intersourced components we have, which ones you can contribute to if you're just looking for something fun to do as a learning experience. But more importantly, as an engineer, if you're trying to find something that you can reuse, the Marketplace is supposed to make it really easy to do that. And so that was actually one of the first plugins that we moved into Runway, and we set it up in such a way that we could open source it because we wanted it to contribute it back to the greater community. So we're actually looking to open source that. I think actually in the next month or two, it's going to hit our open source repo. And then another plugin that I'm excited about that we've kind of just seen a huge adoption on in the last week or two is actually our net promoter score plugin. So that's a combination of an inner source success and a runway success. And the reason I say that is it started just as an inner source repo. And there's a widget for our NPS. So for anybody who's seen that little pop up kind of in the bottom right of a website saying, give us a ranking from one to 10, 
Not to be confused with the annoying pop-up about talking to a robot. Not that one. The one that's saying, can you rank this from 1 to 10? Do you have any comments? Net promoter score, for anybody familiar with that. Somebody created a repo that's a really easy way to embed that um, into a website, and then they tied it to a backend hosted here at American Airlines. So it's you know, for our internal use. But the idea is, hey, here's an inner source repo, drop this into your project. And then through Runway, you can go in here and click to automate your access to the results and set up a new app that you can target for the results when you, you know, plug this bit of code into your website. So what's been really cool is it's an inner source project. And then they decided to automate the access to it through Runway. And what's been just really exciting about the adoption of it, which has just blown up the last couple of weeks, is that all of our projects wanted something like that, but we had engineers finding different solutions for how do we get feedback about our apps. And this is a standard way to do it. And what's also been really amazing about it is that it ties into OKRs. So teams that were trying to find ways to track some sort of rating on their apps now have an OKR that's measurable that they can tie to it and they're using their NPS scores. So that was a really cool win between inner source and automating and runway. And as somebody that's been promoting inner source for the last few years, that was really exciting for me to see. Yeah, both of those sound really amazing, actually. I guess I, I want to dig into the NPS one first. And it sounds like you were saying that it's a tool that lets you add NPS to your public facing tools and then get access to the results through Runway. And I'm curious if you also use this internally, if Runway itself maybe has a pop-up that lets you rate plugins and pieces of Runway. It's funny that you ask that because I think I saw a PR last week related to Runway adding the NPS widget into it. And I don't know if it's been merged yet or not. Um, but so far, NPS or um, inner source repo is primarily used internally. I'm not sure if we're actually using it on any of our public facing stuff just yet. So it has primarily been internal, but we've been adding it. And in fact, one of my other projects, they opened a PR on Friday and we just merged it in. And so I think today we we're going to have that MPS widget popping up for the first time. And it's just kind of, it's one of those things. It's so simple to get set up, but huge, huge value. And this is where we get like, here's a win for inner source. Here's how you don't have to go solve this yourself, let alone set up something on your back end to collect all of it. You can just go here and log into this thing that Runway just gave you access to and boom, you've got your NPS scores. It's been fun. Yep. That's really great. And the inner source thing, I think you introduced it as you're not sure how big of a thing it is. But like I was saying, at Spotify and plenty of places I've talked to, we've been talking about inner source forever. So I think having your inner source marketplace as a plugin at Spotify, I think would be incredibly valuable for us. So at least I'm excited to see you guys open source it in, in Q1. And then I can see if we can make it work internally for us. That's That's awesome. Yeah, it would be really cool because the team has been working on open sourcing marketplace and I'm sure the first company that adopts it and uses it outside of American Airlines will be a huge moment for us. So I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully it'll be us, but I make no promises. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So what's on the roadmap for Runway? What are you excited about adding to Runway? Yeah, so I know when it comes to our shared clusters, they're working on a bunch of functionality for that because right now it's, yay, Runway can create my app in the shared cluster but then it's, okay, where do I go next? And the team has documentation on that, but they're trying to build some more stuff into Runway that gives visibility into the shared clusters. And for somebody like me, who's fairly new to Kubernetes, I appreciate that because, yeah, I can I can find out a few things about something I have hosted in Kubernetes, but having a an easy view into what's going on, especially as um, a technical lead of a team, just being able to see what's going on with my entire product, I'm really looking forward to getting more of that into Runway. And then honestly, it's hard for me to guess what's going to come next from our inner source contributions. I feel like new plugins pop up frequently. So who knows which team's going to add something new next, but that's kind of the fun thing. We have we have runway demos every week. So every Thursday afternoon, we have an internal demo and any of the teams, it doesn't have to be the maintainers, just anybody that's contributed to runway can come in and demo. And so it's always kind of fun to see what pops up on Thursday afternoon and what gets demoed next. Yeah, that, that sounds really fun. One thing I'm curious your opinion on, and obviously you're not representing American or anyone else here, but if you feel that being a developer today is harder or easier than it was before all this stuff. That is a really hard question to answer because as a product engineer, I mean, I put that in quotes, we're kind of expected to do everything nowadays. I remember a decade ago, you were an application developer. You wrote code for an application. You typically had an infrastructure engineer that did all of the, you know, do we need a VM? Do we need a server? How does this network connect to where? You sometimes had a database expert that helped with the database schema. 
But typically there was much more specific roles that we all held. And I think coming to today, here we are in 2022, we're expected to be the jack of all trades as an engineer. There's so much that we're expected to know how to do. And what's powerful about it is you look at the cloud, you can click a button and deploy something, which is amazing. So, I mean, on on one hand, we're in a much better place than we were, you know, back in the day. But at the same time, as an engineer, you're expected to know what to do with that thing you just created in the cloud. And so I would say what's available to us is amazing, but this sheer amount of things that we're supposed to know how to do is also overwhelming. So I would almost say it's getting harder to be an engineer than easier, but the potential is definitely there, and that's exciting. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. I think it was super interesting to learn more about American and about Runway and all the work that your team's been doing. Cool. Well, thank you guys for having me. It really is a privilege to get to be here. So I, I want to finish off by asking each of you what you nerd out about these days. And I think I'll start with Lori because I, th- I think she has an obvious answer. So what the <laughs> the people listening can't see is my background, which is a lot of different Lego sets. So I'm pretty sure Dave thinks that's my answer. And he wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> it's a lot of Lego. And I want to be clear, it's not just a lot of Lego sets. It's the legendary <laughs> big boxes that they set up with like the 16 plus like 5,000 piece ones. I don't have Titanic, I don't have the Coliseum, but within the view right now is uh, Hogwarts, Diagon Alley, Disney Castle, the roller coaster, and in my closet unbuilt is the NES. So yeah, they're the massive builds. For anybody who followed the Olympics this summer, gymnastics is always kind of the prime event that everybody loves to watch. And what's been kind of fun is that those gymnasts have been able to start college gymnastics, which is not something they used to be able to do. I am absolutely terrible at sports, horrible at all athletics, but it's just been really fun to watch. My favorite thing lately is I bought, first bought my kids a couple of remote control cars and I got really quickly bored of watching them play with them. So I bought one for myself and we discovered how easy it is to smash them into things and break them. And so I got into fixing them with my kids and making them stronger. And then we started making them go faster and faster. And so I bought a, a GPS speed monitor thing in my phone. I strapped it inside our car. We got it up to over, I think like 50 or 60 miles per hour before aerodynamics picked up and the thing like took off into the air and flipped over. Thanks for listening to Nerd Out at Spotify. This is the last episode about Backstage for now, but we're sure to talk more about our homegrown developer portal and open source in the future. In the meantime, you can keep up with the project at Backstage.io or jump in and contribute at github.com slash backstage. Thanks to Lori Barth and Brian Leatham from Netflix and Melinda Malmgren from American Airlines. Nerd Out at Spotify is produced by Spotify's Ted Vergakis and Seaplane Armada, who also wrote our fantastic theme song. I'm Dave Zolotuski. Thanks for nerding out with us. <laughs>